So what have we done? Well, in putting together Slim S-A-N-E-R, what we're really trying to do is reimagine some of these traditional machine learning implementations around the concept of function calls on a decoder-based LLM. Now, in this case, what we've done is we've taken these two very, very different types of tasks that you can see in the past had very different types of architectures, and we've brought them together. It has the ability then also to explicitly learn from keys like sentiment, people, organization, and place, which have semantic meaning. So the model has the ability to actually generalize and derive answers from that. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's video. Today, net, net, we're going to show you something that I don't think you've ever seen before. And now I know a lot of our audience, a lot of the people that watch this, you guys follow every new development by every new model maker of everything that's happening. And so usually when you say you've never seen this before, it's pretty hard to say that because you've seen just about everything, you know, certainly over the course of the last several months. However, what we're gonna show is something that on the one hand is very, very common. On the other hand is very new and very different. So why do we have these mythical creatures up on the screen? If I'm getting this right on the left, that's a Sphinx. In the middle, I believe that's a chimera. And on the right, that's a centaur. Now, on the one hand, each of these mythical creatures, they combine the most common things, common animals and people. But by bringing them together and creating these kind of hybrid creatures, it's something that is mythical and actually doesn't exist. And so why are we talking about these mythical creatures? Well, what we're going to be talking about today is, again, something that mixes the common and the banal with something that is really different and really new. And it's really at the intersection of those two things. So what we're going to be talking about is the launch of a new model in our Slim collection, which combines sentiment analysis and named entity recognition. Now, again, you might be yawning because you say, God, sentiment analysis and named entity recognition, these are the kind of things that for years and years and years, you know, machine learning models and encoder-based architectures and classifiers have been dealing with these kinds of problems. But just in the last week, one of the leading, you know, cloud-based data analytics companies at one of their AI events they were talking about sentiment analysis. It's the lead demo that they were showing um, to really talk about the state of the art of AI and how to start bringing it into their platform. Named entity recognition, while again, NER is kind of very old sounding, old fashioned kind of term, let's look at how this is typically done. And let's look at the two sort of leading baselines. And these are models that are widely available. They've been used and downloaded, you know, millions if not tens of millions of times. Let's look on the left. Sentiment analysis. The leading baseline implementations of sentiment analysis, they have been around for five plus years. They're typically built on a BERT encoder architecture, um, usually standard BERT with 110 million parameters. Some are even smaller. So there are some uh, kind of mini BERT kinds of implementations, but typically 110 million parameters for a BERT encoder based sentiment analysis. The way that the model is typically built is with a classification head. Um, it's a layer that you put on top of the model, so to speak. That head then typically has three outputs labels so that for every single sample it's routed into one of these three kind of output channels or signals you go and you actually build a data set with labels of zero one and two corresponding usually to you know negative positive and neutral or, or some synonym for that you then go and you train the model such that the output then layer are these three signals that you're looking at Typically, you're using floating point 32, which means the model binary in memory is around 440 megabytes. And then you do some post-processing on that that's custom to this type of classification head to convert those numbers into labels. What's really interesting and notable about this, and I might make this point a couple of times in this video, is the model, despite the fact that the model has been trained on like a trillion tokens and understands all the semantic meaning and all of these statistical correlations of language, the model does not have the benefit of the semantic meaning of those label categories. All that the model knows is it's taking in some input, it's crunching all the different features of that input, and then it's ultimately reconciling it into a channel zero, one, or two. The model doesn't have the benefit, even though the model has a lot of semantic understanding of something like, quote, sentiment, it doesn't have any ability to use that information of a positive sentiment in actually deriving this explicitly. So the model is lacking some key meaning because of the way that the model architecture is built. And the model architecture then is completely bespoke to sentiment analysis because you're putting on this classification head with three output channels. Now, on the other hand, named entity, 
the leading implementation of named entity, and we've used it, it's an awesome model. It's typically built on Roberta Large, um, which is also an encoder-based architecture, very, very similar to BERT, 355 million parameters. Instead of a classification head with three output channels, it's actually structured as a token classification head in which the number of output, the size of that array, corresponds to the number of tokens that are in the input. And then each token is actually assigned an output label. So it has a number corresponding to each one of those tokens, six to eight to 10, sometimes less than that, but typically then they correspond to the part of speech for that individual token. Also at a baseline, you know, floating point 32, it's about 1.42 gigabytes in memory. And then there's actually a, a reasonable amount of specialized post-processing that you have to do to start stringing the tokens together and the labels and putting them into different categories. You also have kind of awkward things like a specific proper name may actually span three or four or five tokens. You have to really carefully reconstruct those to identify a compound name or a compound phrase as actually belonging to one of these individual categories. And again, just like with sentiment analysis, the model, despite its really deep semantic understanding of a lot of things, cannot explicitly use the meaning of a person or a place or an organization in the context of deriving that classification. So again, we believe that this is a built-in limitation with this encoder-based kind of classical machine learning approach to these problems. So what have we done? Well, in putting together SLIM, S-A, N-E-R, what we're really trying to do is reimagine some of these traditional machine learning implementations around the concept of function calls on a decoder-based LLM. Now, in this case, what we've done is we've taken these two very, very different types of tasks that you can see in the past had very different types of architectures, and we've brought them together. We've brought the data sets together, and then we've been able to do it in a single model architecture without actually changing the fundamental architecture of the model because we've actually used function calls to implement this. Now, the way that it works is actually really simple. You start with a text passage the way that you would in any LLM. There's a function, classify. The parameters are sentiment, people, organization, and place. And when you pass that in, the output of that inference function call is a Python dictionary that has the keys, sentiment, people, organization, and place. And then in each of those keys, it returns a list. That list then has zero or more elements that correspond with that key. The models are 2.7 billion parameters and they're being delivered in two different forms. The main form, a PyTorch model, traditional PyTorch model, is really designed for fine tuning and domain adaptation. And one of the benefits that we see of this architecture and this approach, these models fine tune really well and really fast with much smaller sets of data and without doing nearly as much kind of data engineering in terms of building up that data set to adapt this to a particular type of domain or, or to add an additional key perhaps that you would want to add into this model. But then we also are providing the Slim SANER tool, which is the primary way that we use this model actually for inference. It's fast, it can be run locally. And because it actually has the benefit of GGUF and four bit quantization, as a standalone binary in memory, it's 1.7 gigabytes. So the interesting thing about all of this is if you combine the two reference implementations for a sentiment model and an NER model, doing it the traditional way, those actually add up to about 1.8 gigabytes of memory. So because we're actually able to get all the benefits of quantization, bringing these together in a single model that has substantially more parameters, so it has more learning capacity and depth, it has the ability then also to explicitly learn from keys like sentiment, people, organization, and place, which have semantic meaning. So the model has the ability to actually generalize and derive answers from that. It's, but then finally, it's a single model architecture as well. So we see a lot of benefits to this approach. This is an area of active innovation and research for us. We wanted to put out this model. We have a whole bunch more coming that are both combos and hybrids and really innovative ways to start thinking about using function calling with decoder-based models and small specialized models to do some really new and innovative things. So hopefully this has gotten you a little bit excited about this. You've seen something new. You've seen something that was very familiar. We're gonna pause now. I'm gonna flip over into my IDE and then we can actually take a look. We can see how do you get the model? How do you start running inferences on it? And we're gonna show you a quick demo of how it works. Code's really short because it's actually very, very simple to use these models in LLMware. You import the model catalog. 
You're gonna load the model. Here's the short text that we actually showed in, in the demo on the PowerPoint slide. And then to invoke the model, instead of running an inference on the model, you use the function call method. You pass the text as one of the parameters. The function is classify. And then the parameters are the parameters that we just talked about, sentiment, person, organization, and place. And then we're gonna take a look at the model response. And then after that, we're gonna run a longer test. So what we include with the kit around the model is a self-running test sample, just so you can get a sense then of, of kind of seeing how the model works in action um, across a wider set of samples. And you can actually start to learn a little bit more about how to use it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'll run this twice. I'm just gonna comment this out um, just for a minute. We're just gonna get basically one output here. And as I mentioned, we tend to use the tool version of the models, the, the GGUF version, because it, it uses memory you know, much more efficiently, the model loads faster, and then the inference is ultimately faster as well, even on a local machine. So we are going ahead and running it. First time that you use this model, it is going to pull the model down from the LLMware repository in Hugging Face. You can see here, because the model was already on my local machine, it loads pretty fast, it runs inference pretty fast. The LLM response here is just what we had actually shown in the PowerPoint screen. The LLM response, you can pick up, this is a Python dictionary, so you could use it like any Python dictionary. The sentiment coming up as negative, there were no people referenced in that text. The organization is Tesla, the place is San Francisco. What it then provides a standard part of the output is some of the basic usage metrics. And it also captures the logits. Um, and if you haven't spent any time looking at this, we have several other demos and videos and scripts really walking through how we're analyzing and using some of the logit information to give some probabilistic assessments, some statistical scores, some confidence scores around the output that was given by the model, which is really, really cool and really, really useful with things like sentiment analysis. We're gonna see that when we actually do the tool test run. Okay, it's that easy. Load the model, run a function call, It'll pull it down, it'll download it, install it, it'll create and cache in, in a model repository on your local machine. And then you, you can substitute in for your own text and start running some really sentiment and NER function calls. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead. We're gonna do a longer test here. I'm just gonna go ahead and run it. It's gonna repeat that first step. Now it's actually running through the automated set of test scripts that we include with the model. And you can see even on a local machine, it runs through at a, at a decent clip. And what we actually provide in this test run, as I mentioned, is some insights around the logits and the score, which essentially are the probability distribution, the likelihood of a particular selection, which when applied to a value zone, like the field inside sentiment, gives you a really good sense of the model's level of confidence that it was a positive classification, a neutral classification, or a negative classification. You can see then that sort of nice color coding, as well as showing some of those logit choices, and essentially showing you the confidence level or the likelihood around some of those classifications. This gives you a good sense. We picked a, a sort of a wide range of test materials. It gives you something that you can start to play with in looking at how to combine both sets. R. So I hope you've enjoyed. Any questions, as always, please come to our Discord channel. Thanks again, everybody. Take care and have a wonderful day.